So last time we concluded our look at Paul's laying out of the principles as to why he considered the idea of the law being itself sin to be so very abhorrent. The, the, you remember there were people that were claiming that because the law seems to kill us and slay us, it, it might be in a sense evil because we have to end our relationship to it, that it must be bad. And he said in verses 7 and 8 of chapter 7, this, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. Rather, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would have not known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, worked out in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And so in this week, we're going to start moving on from these two very basic principles. But we have to remember what those principles are. First, that far from being sin itself, through its utter holiness, the law is an absolutely essential part of the gospel in that it exposes and brings us personal understanding of just what sin is. Remember, that was the point of verse 7. And then in verse 8, we see the second part of the answer to that idea that sin is so very powerful that it can twist and use even the law as a base of operations, as a fulcrum which sin can work, or from which sin can work even greater sin within us. The law is indeed powerful. And because it is so very powerful, sin's twisting of it provides such strength to sin that sin seems dead in comparison when looked at apart from the law. So now that he's laid down the principles, in a sense, just in the same way as what he had already done in Romans 6.16, where he had been answering the question and laid down the basic principle saying, do you not know that when you go on presenting yourselves, someone's a slave to obedience? You are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. It's the same kind of an idea. He's laid down the principle. And even so, now Paul is going to work out for us the implications and the particulars of how these principles work out in us. And he does so, you will know, not in a very dry and dispassionate manner. No, this is a remarkably personal matter. It's one so very personal that we can only reasonably conclude that he is giving us his own personal testimony here in verses 9 and 10. Let's read them. Now, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And this commandment, which was to lead to, to life, was found to lead to death for me. Of course, because of the language Paul uses, and we are truly very used to and comfortable with his use of words like death, words like life, in the context of the dead non-Christian and the alive Christian. We may find ourselves in very real trouble if we don't take the time and the effort to realize just what the apostle is saying in these verses. In this case, we need to set that understanding aside. In this case, our context of the preceding verses are critical in us reaching a right understanding. But I really want to call to our attention 
the central event of the sentence. It should be obvious, but I do want to make certain I call it out. The central event is the coming of the commandment. Got that? The central event is the coming of the commandment. And we will go very far astray if we don't get this right. But we do, even if we understand that, get into a great deal of trouble if we don't properly identify when the commandment came to Paul, right? Having read more than a couple commentaries on this, I want to underscore this idea. If we're not careful, if we don't understand, if we don't take the time to analyze this, we will go astray. Why the trouble? Because we and others often don't think carefully through what he's saying. We don't take the time to identify this. For the law was given to who? To Moses, right? When? Someone say 1,400 years prior. Good, good answer, good answer, right? About 1,400 years or so prior to Paul's birth in Tarsus, the law was given to Moses. In fact, if we want to kind of put a mental pin in things, Paul was probably born within a decade or so of Jesus' own birth at Jerusalem, or at uh, um, Bethlehem. So now we have something of a problem because Paul had never lived in a time before the law was in existence. He, along with all of his playmates, would have been taught the law from the time that they could haltingly put together a complete sentence. Right? They never lived in a time where the law didn't exist. Not only would he have been taught the law by his parents at the, and at the local synagogue his family attended, but he was brought up in the city of Jerusalem at the very center of Jewish life and Jewish law. This is what he was relaying to the uh, crowd outside the Roman barracks in Acts 22. He was even, he said there, instructed at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strictness of the law of our fathers. And this too helps us form this and paint this picture of Paul's association with the law. Gamaliel was not an insignificant rabbi, okay? In truth, he was one of the most distinguished teachers of the law a person whose command and understanding of the law was so revered and so respected by all the various parties of the Jews that when he spoke, both Pharisee and Sadducee alike listened carefully. We we see this attested in the case of the apostles when they're brought before the Sanhedrin in Acts 5. In fact, it was the same Gamaliel of whom later writing said, and, and, and I quote, when Rabbi Gamaliel, the elder, died, regard for the Torah ceased, and purity and piety died. You get that? How much respect for the law does Gamaliel have? An enormous respect. Such regard for the law was certain to be passed down to his students. The young man, Saul of Tarsus, among them. And so with such an education as a young man, Paul most certainly learned that the law had been around far longer than himself. So then how is it that we read in Romans 7 of when the commandment came to him? Did he refer back to when Moses gave the law to the people at Sinai? No, that would be absurd. For then his relating of his condition before the law would be impossible. 
Likewise, he cannot be referring to when the law was given to Moses or to the people of Israel, in the sense that due to his Jewish lineage, as they were there, he also, in a sense, was there. No, this too falls short on account of his specific and personal references. I was once alive. I died. The commandment was found to lead to death for me. No, he's not talking about the people of Israel or of Moses. That explanation too must be similarly discarded. The only reasonable answer then lies in this immediately personal context he's been introducing. It is the difference between knowing the words of the law and comprehending its full weight and depth, that moment when you discover just what it means when, it, when the law says, you shall not covet. He's not talking about when he came under the rule and authority of the law. Rather, he's talking about when he himself realized to the core of his being that he himself was under its condemnation. In other words, we're not talking from an objective pers personal or uh, no, I'm sorry, an objective perspective. Rather, Paul is saying this from a personal, subjective, experiential point of view. The key to understanding the difference then is in seeing when Paul finally looks at the law of God and has that aha moment. Right? The instant he really personally comprehends the law and all of its impact. When did this realization come to him? He doesn't say. But based on the rest of his teaching, I think we can reasonably narrow it down to sometime prior to his conversion in the middle of Acts 9. It's the same thing that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 3, 14-16. But their minds were hardened. For until this day, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil, now he's talking about the veil over Moses so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the consequence of Moses' message. The same veil remains unlifted because it is brought to an end in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. In other words, the law had not yet come to them. It was old to them. It was dead to them. So then with our realization that Paul was talk, is talking here about his personal recognition of the law, as applying to him, as condemning he himself, which is the central event that he speaks of when he's saying, when the commandment came. Now, with that in mind, we can begin to correctly understand what Paul's saying here. First, there is a clear and certain symmetry to what he's saying. He speaks of the situation before the law came in such a forceful manner to him. And then after, he realizes what the law is truly saying. Everything seems to be reversed, flipped on its head. Before the law, he felt alive. After the law, he felt as if he were dead. It goes even further. After his realization of the law, it says sin revived. Now what does that tell us about before the law came to him? Beforehand, sin seemed dead to him, and he himself felt alive. That's exactly what he's saying at the end of verse 8. Apart from the law, sin is dead. So let's look carefully at the first state. And I start at the end of verse 8. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Now I was once alive apart from the law. 
This first phrase provides us a most in, entirely appropriate view of man in his natural state. Before he realizes the terrible and eternal condemnation of the law, I was once alive apart from the law. At this point, remember, he still has the veil over his heart. It's not yet been taken away in the words of Corinthians. So now remember, he's not speaking in terms of an objective spiritual life. He's talking about his own personal perspective. He's talking in relative terms. How ought we understand this? Think of the common person on the street, blissfully unaware of the eternal wrath of God. They go about their days without a care in their world. Their position is certain. They're, they're, they're sure of it. And Paul himself certainly knew about this life. In fact, we read in, in, as Pastor was going through Philippians chapter 3 and verses 4 through 6, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. In other words, he feels himself to be full of light. He doesn't have to worry about what the future might bring. A man in this state is certain that if there is a God, He's certainly very pleased with them, that they have nothing to fear. They have a view like the Pharisee in Luke 18, who stood and was praying these things to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. This is a person who, might, who may rightly understand that some people are evil, <coughs> but just as certainly they would not place themselves in that category. For in their own mind and to their own understanding, if they even do think of the law, they say to themselves, look here, I already do these things. I have no need to feel like I've fallen short. And so the terrible stain of sin is relatively muted in their mind. It's easily dismissed as a passing thought or a fancy. And so great is the tyranny of sin that it sears the conscience of all under its thumb. It dulls those under its dominion to the awful truth of its power. As far as he is concerned, the law is, in a sense, dead. It can't do anything to them. And not only that, but as we consider the opposite of sin being revived, he considers that just as the law is dead to him, so is sin dead to him. Sin, such a man thinks, even... Now get this, even a person as theologically astute as Saul of Tarsus, such a man thinks that sin is dead and that he himself is very much alive. Such a man may be full of strength, full of life, full of vigor. In fact, there's a famous poem by William Henley that proclaims it in which he says, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. There you see it. There we see the man who was in the position of Paul before the commandment came. Such men are unable and prevented from realizing the full and terrible truth of the law until they begin to turn to the Lord. But then, then, but the commandment 
came. Understanding of the law comes. Not the bright facade which, if it considers the law, sees it as a means to destroy and remove sin. But the veil is lifted. The delusion is shattered. You are quickened, the authorized says in Ephesians 2.1. I came to understand what sin is, is what Paul is seeming to say here. I, me, who formerly had no real understanding of coveting, in this instant underwent a complete reversal of my former condition. So where sin once seemed to be dead, and he himself seemed to be alive, now it seems to him that sin has sprang to life. And that he himself died. Sin revived, and I died. Suddenly, Paul is saying, this world around him was shattered. And in horror, he realized how very deluded his thinking was. For when the law came to him, he realized just how very wrong he had been. Rather than being free from the condemnation of the law all along, he realized that though he had thought he was free, he was in fact enslaved to sin. And on account of the law making it clear that it was sin, the law then condemned him. He stood guilty before God. He realized that far from not having to worry about the law, far from thinking that he was all right by the law, instead, all the while, it had been accumulating an enormously long list of his transgressions. In other words, when the law came to him, when the veil was lifted and he truly understood it, he realized that his perception was entirely at odds with reality. And of the law. But instead, he realized then how very subjective and flawed his view was. Instead of sin being dead, it was alive. Instead of it being of no account and not doing anything, it was actively causing him harm. And just as when he was once full of life and exuberant in his view of the world, instead it crashed down on him mightily, so very mightily, that he felt as if he were dead. The world had seemed to stop for him as he was brought to the depths of despair on account of understanding, I myself covet. I covet and therefore I stand condemned. He realized the very truth then and there when the law came to him that he has already expressed for us in Romans 3, verse 10. There's none righteous, not even one. He understood again and what he said in, later in verse 20 of chapter 3, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And he understood for the first time what he would write in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God. In horror, he realized that rather than those verses and those ideas applying to other people, it applied to he himself. The Pharisee of Pharisees. The one who said, as to the law, I'm blameless. And he realized how very blameful he was. In fact, up to that point, according to his testimony in Galatians 1.14, he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, among my countrymen, being far more zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And so through this new personal understanding and personal comprehension of the law, sin revived. Instead of being muted, 
instead of being far from his mind and his thoughts, each new thought, each new moment is held up to this full comprehension of what the law was saying. And in stark realization, it exposed every thought for the sin that it was. Was it there all along? Yes. But he hadn't been aware of it. That's what he's saying here. Now that he was aware of it, now that he was examining every new thing, every thought, every deed afresh, he was driven to despair on account of realizing sin's prevalence in his life. He'd never known the real power of the sin that was already there within him is what he's saying. Sin revived and I died. Not only is he now freshly and acutely aware of his condemnation, But when we understand this as the mirror image of his feelings of being so very alive previously, we realize that he's been consumed with the realization of his utter hopelessness of being found righteous by God. Instead of feeling full of life and vigor, he now feels the crushing weight of his sin, mourning because of it, realizing that there is no possible way which he could possibly consider himself blameless according to the law ever again. Rather than being strong and vibrant, he finds himself falling to the ground as if he's dead, just like it described in Acts chapter 9. Being struck by the immensity of his debased state before God. This is, of course, the same thing that the apostle meant when he wrote in Galatians 3.24, where he says, therefore the law has become our tutor unto Christ. For through the law there is no possibility of justification, nor is there possibility of sanctification. Through the law there is only condemnation. And if you look at yourself and do not viscerally viscerally understand that you stand as one who rightly ought to be condemned by God through your sin, then this central realization, the coming of the law, when the commandment came, has never come to you. You still feel yourself to be alive apart from the law. You don't view the law rightly. The very point of the law, then, is for us to realize that we, by ourselves, cannot meet God's holy requirements. It is impossible. (coughs) It is a command which no person can ever withstand. And we, too, must have the veil removed from our hearts that we may understand this. There's only one who kept the law in its entirety, and his name was Jesus Christ. We must come to view ourselves not as the Pharisee of Luke 18, but as the tax collector he despised. The one who stood some distance away and was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. It is absolutely essential then to our salvation that we realize that we ourselves are utter and complete sinners. We must understand the truth of John 1.10, or I'm sorry, 1 John 1.10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, meaning God, a liar, and his word is not in us. But God is no liar. We must see ourselves as David saw himself in Psalm, 30, Psalm 38. Turn there real quick. Psalm 38. O oh, Yahweh, Reprove me not in your wrath. 
And discipline me not in your burning anger, for your arrows have pressed deep into me, and your hand has pressed down upon me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation, and there is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities go over my head as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. My wounds stink and rot because of my folly. I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long for my loins are filled with burning and there's no soundness in my flesh. I'm faint and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. Lord, all my desires before you and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs My strength forsakes me in the light of my eyes. Even that has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those who search for my life lay snares for me, and those who seek to do me evil have threatened destruction, and they meditate on deception all day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. And I am like a man who does not hear. And in those in, in, in whose mouth are no reproofs. For I wait on you, O Yahweh. You will answer me, O Lord my God. For I said, save, lest they be glad over me who, when my foot stumbles, magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and strong, and those who wrongfully hate me abound. And those who repay evil for good, they accuse me. For I pursue what is good. We must come to the point where we know beyond doubt, just as David did, our only reasonable response on account of discovering the terrible weight of our own personal sin, just what Paul is talking about here in Romans chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, is to abandon any hope within ourselves. We don't need to decide for Christ as if we're doing him a favor, but to throw ourselves wholeheartedly at the feet of Christ Jesus with utter abandon, exclaiming with David the last two verses of that psalm, do not forsake me, O Yahweh. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. To despise this message to proclaim only that God is love and that we must make a decision to love him back is to fail to realize our true need for a savior. It is to remain alive apart from the law with the veil still in place over our hearts. And so once again, we see that although the law is completely unable to justify or to sanctify us, it is absolutely essential that it come to us. That we have that personal understanding, that we discern the, what the law is meant to do with unveiled hearts and to feel its condemnation. For only in that condition can we truly understand our need for Christ Jesus and to be separated from the law? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you and I praise you for the magnificence of the law. I thank you that it reveals our personal sin to us when it comes to us. Father, I pray that we would each look rightly at the law and understand its condemnation. 
and on account of our continually understanding, I would be condemned by this, that we constantly run to Christ, throw ourselves at his feet, and beg for mercy, and believe in him as he commands, as the Father commands. Father, I pray that we would rightly teach others not simply to turn to Jesus because he's going to give you health and wealth and prosperity, but to turn to Jesus because that is the only salvation from our sin, from the evil that we do and from its dominion over us. Father, I pray that as we consider the weight of these words, that we would also understand the glory in it, that the law has a place, an enormously important place as we consider what is the gospel, and that we not shirk from declaring the law along with declaring the Christ. That we may deliver the whole counsel of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You've been listening to a free message from Hickory Corners Bible Church. You're welcome to pass this recording along to others but please don't charge for it or alter it without written permission from Hickory Corners Bible Church. For more information about us, please visit us online at hickorycornersbible.org. There you can connect with us as well as join in supporting this ministry. You can also follow us on Facebook and YouTube to see the latest messages from our teaching and preaching ministries. Again, our website is hickorycornersbible.org.